Good evening. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Welcome, everyone. And thank you for taking the time to attend our event this evening. It's just delightful to see so many members of the legal community, so many staff, uh, so many faculty, and so many students and alumni here this evening. Uh, we're really looking forward to uh, the panel that you see before you. Um, this evening event is part of the LIND initiative and the policy at UBC series, which, uh, both of which are hosted by the Liu Institute for Global Issues. And we're very happy to have with us this evening the Deputy Director, Julie Wagemakers, who was um, instrumental in helping us put this evening together. So thank you very much, Julie. Um, the LIND initiative in U.S. studies seeks to inspire students to become thought leaders and enhance mutual understanding in Canada and U.S. relations. So, you really can't do better than that. What an exciting thing to be a part of. This evening's event is also part of the UBC Centennial Event Series, a series of um, events uh, that I seem to attend once every week, but which in general throughout the year and many more than one time a week celebrate the 100th anniversary of the University of British Columbia. The first class started on the 30th of September in 1915 with 379 students. So. My goodness, we've come a long way since then. Um, it is my great pleasure this evening to introduce Professor Stieglitz. And I have to tell you that in the time I've been allotted, I would not even be able to read the titles of all of the books that Professor Stieglitz has published. And so I just want to um, recount a very few highlights of his astonishing career, which included, of course, as we are all aware, uh, turn as Senior Vice President and Senior e Economist at the World Bank. Um, in 2001, he was awarded the Nobel Prize in recognition of his groundbreaking work establishing a new field, the economics of information. And his 2002 book, Globalization and Its Discontents, has sold more than a million copies worldwide, and those are just the legal copies. There are at least uh, two complete pirated editions available. Um, he has received more than 40 honorary doctorates and is a member of the French Legion of Honor. And I have just been allowed to hold for the first time the, the book which has been published this month, and it is Rewriting the Rules of the American Economy, an Agenda for Growth and Shared Prosperity, a book which, which Professor Stieglitz has just told me is particularly focused on the intersection of the law uh, and economic rules, especially in the United States. But I'm really looking forward also to the next book, which astonishingly is just two months away, called The Euro, <laughs> How a Common Currency Threatens the Future of Europe. Um, so with that uh, far too brief introduction, please join me in welcoming Professor Stieglitz. I'm now going to turn the microphone over to Associate Dean Natasha Affolder, who will introduce the rest of our panel and will be your moderator for this evening. Thank you very much, Dean Doveron. It's a real privilege to introduce the four members of faculty on this panel. They are all scholars whose work interrogates law's relationship with inequality in quite different contexts. I know that a number of law students, and I can see a lot of them in the audience um, today, are intently curious about what law professors do when they're not in the classroom. And um, it's quite revealing that a number of my colleagues spend an inordinate amount of time thinking about how law perpetuates and deepens the inequality around us. So this maybe gives you some glimpse uh, into an answer to that question. And that's particularly why it's a privilege to work in this faculty. Each of the four scholars to my left has produced rigorous scholarship unpacking inequality in legal contexts. And each of them has also put considerable thought into the prescriptive piece, deciding what now can be done. I get to spend every day with these people. So it's nice on an occasion like tonight to step back and celebrate their work and scholarly achievements. And I'm not only saying nice things now because I'm gonna be incredibly ruthless and cruel as a timer, to very briefly introduce the panelists, 
Um, immediately beside me is Assistant Professor Galit Sarfadidi, who is the Canada Research Chair at the Law School in Global Economic Governance. Professor Sarfadi's scholarship offers an anthropological perspective to the study of international law and regulatory governance. She has a particular focus on non-state actors in their many guises. Her very well-cited books and numerous articles focus on the convergence of economic globalization with public law values such as human rights. Uh, Professor David Duff, who I thought was speaking after her, who has now been demoted to third speaker, <laughs> and so I won't tell you about him next. <laughs> More exciting is Professor Joel Backer, <laughs> our second speaker tonight, who writes and researches in the areas of constitutional law, socio-legal studies, legal theory, and economic law. Professor Backen's landmark book and film, The Corporation, The Pathological Pursuit of Power and Profit, has just celebrated its 10-year anniversary. And given that anniversary, it's an opportune moment to recognize the impact that book has had both on scholarship and on public debate. More recently, he has published on how big business targets children, and he's currently interrogating the relationship between private governance and the rule of law, something we'll hear more about tonight. Now that other guy is sitting beside him, uh, Professor David Duff, is a noted authority on a wide range of issues in the area of tax law and policy, including environmental taxation, comparative and international taxation, and distributive justice. He has authored and co-authored some of the leading textbooks uh, across the area of tax law that I often see being hauled across uh, campus and certainly around this building, and if nothing else, they are weighty. <laughs> As you he is the, uh, has developed a tax LLM here at the Allard School of Law, and as you'll hear in the comments that he'll give tonight, he has a few ideas to help our new federal liberal government in the area of tax policy. He's eager to speak tonight about the areas of sexy tax policy um, that he and Professor Stiglitz share an interest in. And finally, we have the intellectual mastermind behind this evening's event, Professor Christy Ford, who is the director of our Center for Business Law. As a scholar, her work has had an international impact, particularly in the areas of regulatory theory that relate to international Canadian US uh, securities law. Professor P Ford has in her most recent work pushed back against the slavish cult of innovation worshippers and her work on the relationship between regulation and financial innovation is truly groundbreaking. So now over to Professor Stiglitz for some opening remarks to get this exciting panel underway. Okay, well thank you very much. So let me just make a few opening uh, remarks. Uh, it's not a surprise that there's been so much, uh, such an increase of interest in inequality. It just follows from the fact that inequality has grown so much. Uh, if there were no inequality, or if inequality was at the level that it was 50 years ago, 40 years ago, uh, I think there would be much less interest. Uh, what's happened in the United States, we're sort of the leader uh, in the world in this uh, field. I'm not sure it's a, uh, something we should be proud of, but it is. Uh, we have more inequality than any other uh, advanced country. And the, a couple metrics that give you a feeling for what has been happening is the share of the top 1% has doubled in the last 30 years. The share of the top one-tenth of percent has increased by almost fourfold. And uh, the idea, uh, there was a prevailing idea called trickle-down economics that if the top do well, everybody else does. I wish it were true because the top has done so well that if it were true, uh, we'd all be well off. But uh, the actually median income, that is in income, you know, half above, half below, median income in the United States now is lower than it was a quarter century ago. Median income of a full-time male worker is lower than it was 40 years ago. And at the bottom, real wages adjusted for inflation are basically lower than they were 60 years ago. So 
if you we have an economy that has not delivered for most of our citizens, and uh, I think that's a failed economy. But the question then is, what has brought this about? And uh, is it just a matter of unfortunate way the laws of supply and demand worked, like, you know, the gravity changed, and, and all of a sudden, because of that change, uh, there's more inequality? Well, the answer is no, it's not because of changes in technology or globalization or all of that, or they may have played a role. Um, the reason we know that it's not just those forces is that if you look around the countries of the world, there are very large differences in the level of inequality, uh, very big differences in the level of equality of opportunity, and there are some countries where the level of inequality has actually been coming down. So that if it were just economic laws, then it would be similar things in similar countries, but they're very, very different. So that's why I've said inequality is a matter of choice, not the choice of the individual, obviously, but the choice of our society. And uh, the key argument uh, is contained in my most recent book, Rewriting the Rules. It's the way we've structured our economy. And when I say structure economy, it's about the laws, regulations, uh, that lead to the outcomes that we have. So one way of thinking about this is about a third of a century ago, the United States began, you might say, a big experiment where we uh, changed uh, our tax laws. We said lower the tax rate on the top. We changed our regulation. We said let's... Uh, liberalize our financial markets and other exchange laws across the board. I'll describe a few of those in a minute. And the effect of that was the lower tax rates were supposed to incentivize the economy. The uh, liberalization was supposed to give that incentives more room, more scope for, for <coughs> being exercised. And the net effect of all of that was that there was supposed to be higher economic growth. And the notion was that, yes, that there would be more inequality, but the size of the piece of the pie, the size of the, that everybody gets, including the middle or the bottom, would actually be increased. Well, we now have in the United States a third of a century of this, ex uh, of this experiment, so we can declare you know, some reliability. It's not a one-year experiment. This is a third of a century of an experiment, and it's a failure. The one thing where they were right is it did lead to more inequality. Uh, so their prediction on that was right, but every other aspect, actually growth slowed down, and that's why we got these very adverse effects that I've described. So then the question is, what exactly were the aspects of our legal framework, our economic framework, that led to these outcomes? And that's what this most recent book uh, tries to look at. It looks at um, the change in corporate law that led to short-term firms where the CEO pay went from 30 to 1 to over, on average, 30, uh, uh, 30 times the, the pay of the average worker to over 300 times, much larger than in other advanced countries. Um, without any evidence that it's related to productivity or economic performance. So the question is, what has led to this kind of extreme behavior in the corporation, this kind of short-termism, which has both increased inequality and undermined economic performance? So in this book, we, we try to outline, just taking that as one example, a whole series of changes in tax laws uh, that have led to this result, in, in laws about disclosure, um, in uh, corporate governance laws, in the financial sector regulation, which together have combined to lead, lead, result in these outcomes.
So you'll notice in this coming election in the United States in 2016, some of the presidential candidates are articulating the view that I'm putting forward here, that they're saying there's a real problem with the United States in terms of both the short-termism related to inequality and it's related to our legal structure and that we have to change this. So that's one example of, uh, uh, of how we structure um, what goes on. Um, tax laws uh, where we uh, uh, tax, uh, say, le speculators at half the rate that we do people who work for a living obviously distorts the economy. You don't get more land for more land speculation. At least nobody has been able to show that uh, is technically the land elasticity is pretty close to zero. Uh, uh, but you get a lot of inequality out of it, including one of our Republican no uh, nominees. Uh, his, the wealthy he has, we don't know how much that is, um, but <laughs> uh, is, is related to uh, that kind of speculation. Um, bankruptcy laws, uh, normally viewed as a really boring topic that you only study in law school, actually have very big implications in the United States. Um, you know, most country with humane bankruptcy laws, workers uh, are first in line when a company goes bankrupt. The notion is that they gave their work they can't get it back. I'm sorry, you know, I, I, that was a bad deal. The company went bankrupt. You can't get your time back. It's, it's gone. And so, and workers tend to be dependent on their wages. And so that's why all civilized countries, except the United States, give workers first priority. In the United States, they changed the law when nobody was looking. And this is an other issue that's very important is transparency and governance. Uh, we changed the law to give derivatives. CDS is first claimant when somebody goes bankrupt, when a company goes bankrupt. On the other hand, we also changed the laws to say that student debt basically could not be discharged even through bankruptcy. So that changes the political relationships and, and the distribution of income. Other aspects, obvious examples of labor law where you make collective action more difficult. But other aspects of the law where you make it more difficult to have class action suits because that means if a corporation abuses somebody a little bit, an individual can't sue. And it's only through class suit, the class action suits that you can get some redress of the imbalance between the corporate corporation and individuals. But uh, we've made those much more, much more difficult. Um, uh, I could go through, you know, antitrust law obviously uh, is very important for the creation of monopoly power. Uh, um, uh, so uh, the, the important point is that we could go through every aspect of our legal framework and the reforms over the last third of a century have been designed to create more inequality and have had the incidental effect of making a less efficient economy. So the title of the other book, uh, The Price of Inequality, is that we actually are paying a very high price for this inequality. Uh, and one more book, The Great Divide, as long as I'm that good. <laughs> um, uh, by the way, uh, another aspect of growing inequality I'll get to, uh, 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 is intellectual property. And um, um, I was uh, in uh, Lima uh, a few weeks ago at the IMF meetings, and uh, we were having a, a discussion about uh, 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 various issues uh, uh, related to the uh, creation of inequality. And um, uh, one, uh, the person sitting next to me was Dusebaum, who is the head of the uh, ECOFIN, the, the finance ministers of, of uh, 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 of uh, Europe, of the Eurozone, and um, I, I, I couldn't help but give a plug a little bit for, the, uh, for my book, Rewriting the Rules, and he made a snide remark and said, oh, you're just trying to get more royalties, and I pointed out that any of you can download the book free of charge 
from the Roosevelt Institute website, because our interest is making sure that people understand this issue, and that, that so that there's no intellectual property. If you want to buy the printed version, of course, you'll have to pay, but, but the, there is a version available free uh, at the Roosevelt Institute website. <laughs> Please wait till the duration of the panel to do your download. <laughs> uh, thanks very much for foreshadowing so many of the issues that I know our, our panelists want to discuss further. So we'll turn over to Professor Sarfati. Thank you very much. Uh, first, it's, it's a great honor to be here as part of the panel. Um, and I'll begin by just briefly describing my research and how it relates to Professor Stiglitz's work, and then discuss an important issue that I think overlaps with the theme of inequality. So as uh, Professor O'Folder described, my research focuses on the regulation of transnational economic activity and the convergence of economic globalization with human rights. And so I draw from an anthropological background to study the ways in which international economic laws operate in practice. My earlier work focused on the decision-making process within the World Bank, an institution that Professor Stiglitz knows intimately well. And I studied the bureaucratic obstacles that have been impeding the bank's adoption of a human rights policy or comprehensive framework. But my current research that I'm speaking about today is with regard to global supply chains and human rights, which similarly explores the human rights dimension of economic globalization. And this research addresses a critical area within international economic law, which is the regulation of global supply chains among multinational corporations. So with the globalization of business, firms are increasingly relying on third-party suppliers who come from countries plagued by weak governance. And recent tragedies, including the collapse of the Rana Plaza garment factory in Bangladesh that killed more than 1,000 people, highlight the risks of outsourcing production to suppliers with poor working conditions. So my own work focuses on the regulation of global supply chains and human rights through the use of domestic law. And these laws aim to promote global supply chain transparency through mandatory disclosures. Some of these laws have been appearing in the U.S., including the California Transparency and Supply Chains Act of 2010, as well as the Dodd-Frank Act's Conflict Minerals Provision, Section 1502. But a question remains as to whether law can effectively regulate global supply chains at all, or if there are alternative non-legal mechanisms for addressing the human rights abuses that are committed by corporations and their suppliers abroad. So the questions that I have for you are, first, if you think that certain inequalities are embedded and inherent in the process of global outsourcing, or if you think that, role, uh, or if you think that law has a role to play in promoting more responsible supply chain management. Secondly, do you have any thoughts as to how to incentivize companies to respect human rights more? And more basically and ultimately, um, my question is, is there a way to prevent future tragedies such as Rana Plaza? Thanks. Well, just to uh, pick up the last question, uh, you're not going to be able to prevent it, but you can reduce the likelihood that it will occur. Well, let me make just a, a whole set of comments uh, related to what you uh, said. Um, first, just uh, in terms of the World Bank, I, it's not just the bureaucratic processes. We have uh, some very, uh, in the governance of the World Bank, there are some very non-democratic governments and very corrupt governments who don't believe in democracy. And so when you have an institution in which uh, that is uh, uh, there are some very loud voices. I mean, let me just give you one example. Um, actually, the charter of the World Bank originally said that it could not get involved in, uh, quote, political issues. It was supposed to be economics. And, um, uh, of course, they were intervening in politics all the time, privatization, you know, where were the boundaries? So, so it, it was really, it was when we thought, it, when, the World Bank or the U.S. Treasury thought it was good politics, then it was economics. Uh, but when they disagreed, then it was politics. 
So uh, one of the big changes that did occur while I was there was uh, corruption, the discussion of corruption. And there were some governments who were very adamant that we not talk about corruption um, because they said that was political. And the only way that we were able to change the World Bank to be able to talk about corruption is that we did some studies, admittedly flawed, but the fact is flawed studies can still have political effects, that showed <laughs> that there was a correlation between corruption and economic performance, a, a negative correlation, I mean, <laughs> that more corrupt, uh, uh, and that therefore what happened in terms of corruption did have a relevance to what the bank was doing. And that turned out, it's an interesting example where it allowed the bank then to undertake a whole set of activities related to, to corruption, and it was only uh, because of those uh, uh, studies. Um, the, uh, the issue of uh, global supply chains is really an important one um, because it is a way that companies can try to absolve themselves of responsibility. So it's not like these supply chains uh, and this decentralization is, is inevitable. It's, it's actually uh, part of a way that corporations can basically, uh, you know, somebody who would in American tax law not be called an independent contractor because all of his sales is to the company, you know, it, it, it would not satisfy the normal criteria, is called, oh, he's a, is a separate company. And that absolves you of the responsibility for bad labor conditions or anything else that happens. So in some other areas, we've actually, you know, we look through that notion that he's an independent supplier. So it seems to me that we should be taking a stronger view in trying to look through supply chain and say with criteria that if you, are, if, if, if there is enough of a business relationship, you are accountable. So I, I think we, we ought to make liability stronger than, than it currently is. Um, the, the issue, you know, of, uh, uh, the laws and regulations, uh, including transparency, how they affect behavior, I think is very important and again is one of the themes of this book, Rewriting the Rules. Uh, let me just pick up uh, a couple of examples uh, uh, that you remarked on that, that illustrate how contentious it is and the fact that it's contentious suggests that these are important because if they were totally unimportant, uh, they wouldn't be contentious. <laughs> So uh, in the Dodd-Frank uh, bill, they, uh, there is a regulation, there was a provision that for the disclosure of transfers of money from the mining and, and oil companies to the developing countries. And the view was that that disclosure would have impacts because money was going, say, to Angola, but the people of Angola weren't getting the money. Um, and you, you know, everybody knows where that money was going. But if we knew exactly, if there was disclosure, then it would, it would put, uh, uh, generate uh, greater uh, force for citizens to demand uh, more accountability of the government. You know, you just got a check for a billion dollars. Where did it go? So under the current regime, nobody knows exactly how much money they got. Okay. So that was the idea of, Dodd, uh, of this provision, Dodd-Frank. Everybody, by the way, was surprised that it got into Dodd-Frank. And it's a real achievement. It's an important point because sometimes students ask, how can I make a difference? This was the result of civil society groups putting pressure on Congress. And it sometimes works. I mean, our Congress is owned by uh, the banks and by uh, special interests, but occasionally we do get things through, and this was an example. But having gotten it through, the, the, um, uh, it was challenged, uh, uh, the SEC was dealt, uh, had the responsibility to put forward the regs that would implement this, and those regs were challenged then uh, by, in court by uh, the oil companies. Uh, 
all of them except one. Um, one of them, uh, Stad Oil, which is not surprising, owned by the Norwegian people. And the Norwegian people happen to believe in transparency uh, and, and good governance. And so it was one of the cases where ownership made a difference uh, and some other people putting pressure on them, I'll say that. Um, but it, but it, 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 it had, uh, uh, they, they dropped out of the, the alliance of all the oil companies putting, uh, challenging this. Um, and the court supported uh, the oil companies on a on a bureaucratic grounds and this goes back to procedure uh which we're talking about the the uh united states and i don't know the canadian you know we have uh, the, the the common process where you you uh you propose a regulation and then everybody can make comments and then the regulatory uh, authority sec has to respond to all the comments and it's, it's an imbalance of power because what the, what the corporations have done have limited the, in, the, the, uh, the uh, uh, budget of the SEC, so they don't have any resources. The lobbyists have infinite resources, so they put in an infinite number of comments. So with the finite resources, to answer the comments, the infinite number of comments, it's it's a un, uh, unlevel playing field, and it's very difficult for them to answer. Now, um, you know they may so so eventually they will answer those comments, but it was on that procedural issue that it got uh, overruled, and 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 that meant another Dodd Frank was passed in 2010, and we're 2015, and there's still no regulation on uh, this important area. Um, the, uh, one of the issues that you raised is can private norms, self-regulation substitute for government regulation? Uh, you know, can, uh, uh, and I think the answer is no, clearly not. And, um, you know, that self-regulation is what we tried on the banks. And even even Alan Greenspan says that was a mistake. He called it the flaw in his reasoning. It cost the country $5 trillion, but we won't uh, uh, mention that. Uh, there was a flaw in his reasoning. Self-regulation doesn't work. And it's interesting. Um, I was uh, in a meeting, uh, you know, a relatively small meeting, uh, with uh, the head of one of the world's la largest mining companies, uh, a meeting with the premier of China, and uh, he said, we need stronger regulation. And I was a little bit of surprised because, you know, usually you think of, of uh, corporations wanting less regulation. And uh, so I asked him afterwards, you know, I, I, I was a little bit befuddled why, why you asked for it. And he said, the problem is we are a public company where we're big enough and visible enough is if we behave badly, all the NGOs, all the civil society groups will come down hard on us. But there are some Canadian privately held mining companies where they engage in all kinds of bad uh, environmental human rights behavior and they're not subject to the same kind of pressure that we as a public company are. So we want strong regulation so there's a level playing field. So it was an interesting, it, it was an interesting perspective that, that he was arguing, uh, and I, I won't tell you the name of the mining company, the Canadian mining company, you can probably figure it out, uh, probably more than one. Uh, but uh, the point is that it illustrates that that uh, there is a, an unlevel playing field. I mean, that, that, that private norms are not sufficient. Uh, that they are important. Let me say, I, I think one of the one of the, if you want to think of what what the SDGs are, the Sustainable Development Goals that were just adopted, they're part of of global norm building. And I think that's important, but one shouldn't think of that as a substitute for formal legal. Uh, from legal structures. 
Just to prove to this audience how well manicured we are in our panel, um, the private governance angle is exactly the point of transition in which we wanted to turn to Professor Backham's comment. Yeah. Um, well, first, let me thank you for coming along tonight. Really appreciate it and an honor to be part of all of this. Now, in your recent book, um, you describe the rule of law as the hallmark of an advanced civilized society a uh, principle that is supposed to protect the weak against the strong and ensure fair treatment for all. And then you persuasively uh, argue that this equality-promoting ideal of rule of law uh, is routinely and systematically belied and contradicted in practice. And you gave some examples in your opening comment about uh, how and why. Uh, laws are too often substantively, substantively oriented in ways that promote inequality. They're enforced in ways that promote inequality. And add to that the fact uh, that uh, people have unequal access to law, which uh, you say, which sounds really nice and I agree with, gives an advantage to large corporations and the wealthy. Uh, and therefore further uh, entrenches inequality. So what I'd like to ask you about uh, this evening, and it's related to what you were talking about at the end of your last answer and what Galit uh, was discussing, um, is a further uh, tendency that I think is undermining this egalitarian notion of rule of law, and that's the current trend away from mandatory legal regulation and towards uh, private voluntary self-regulation across areas of workers' welfare, human rights, consumer protection, environmental protection, all areas where people and environmental interests are vulnerable to harm and undue exploitation at the hand of companies. Uh, and a key part of this move as well is the privatization of uh, dispute resolution, of adjudication itself, the move towards private arbitration. Uh, we've reached a point where commentators are now describing private regulation as, and I'm quoting one here, an entirely new mode of international governance. Uh, where private regulation is, and I'm quoting another, pushing the one central official or state law to the global edge. Uh, now, one of the arguments typically made in support of this tendency, uh, and I guess what I'd like to ask you, and I think I know your answer, is do you find this persuasive? Um, <laughs> the argument that's made is that corporations are now genuinely socially responsible. It's no longer just a public relations move, and so we can trust them uh, to regulate themselves rather than having to rely on governments to regulate them. And I'll quote none other than Labor uh, Prime Minister, though he was Chancellor of the Exchequer at this point, Gordon Brown, uh, who spoke glowingly about how in the future we'll be replacing, quote, the old regulatory system with trust in the responsible company. I think only a Labor Party uh, Prime Minister could say that and get away with it. Um, so there's that question. Is this whole link between CSR and privatization of regulation plausible? And I guess the second question, it's more general, is do you worry, as I do, that this movement towards private regulation is working to undermine uh, the egalitarian notion of rule of law that you uh, adhere to and to further entrench inequality in uh, global society. Yeah. Uh, first, let me say, I, uh, uh, I think uh, corporate social responsibility is real, but it's more real as a PR than as, as a uh, real reality. So uh, when... Uh, companies talk to me about corporate responsibility, I say, you know, the first corporate responsibility is paying their taxes. And yet most companies spend an enormous amount of energy avoiding paying taxes. And I don't want to get ahead of the story on, on taxation, but, but, but I can't, you know, uh, you talk about corporate responsibility. You have Apple and Google you know, Apple, the largest corporation in, in the world, basically paying no taxes. And it's not like it's not because it has no profits. <laughs> uh, it's because it has used the same ingenuity to make iPhones that everybody buys to avoid taxes. And, you know, if it, if it actually had used that ingenuity to make something socially useful, it would be even greater. But, uh, but, but uh, the fact is that, that uh, this is, you know, something that, that 
uh, there's a uh, corporations, and this goes back to uh, uh, what we were saying before, um, corporations in modern corporate law in the United States has said that the first responsibility of the corporation is to its shareholders. Now that didn't always, it wasn't always the case. And there are other countries where there are other legal frameworks where there's more stakeholder, shareholder, uh, uh, stakeholder uh, responsibility. But the way American law has evolved is, uh, and I wouldn't be surprised Canadian law has evolved, I don't know, uh, is very much your first responsibility and only responsibility is to your shareholders. And this is a perversion of both economic and legal doctrines that was actually promoted a lot by Milton Friedman um, there is actually no economic theory that says that shareholder, maxima, shareholder maximiza value maximization leads to the maximization of the well-being of society. Um, that th there are some conditions under which that might be true, but those are conditions like perfect information, perfect risk markets, conditions that we know are not true. So that in the real world conditions, we can show very strongly that shareholder ma value maximization is not, in general, welfare uh, maximizing. So with a legal framework that says they're supposed to be maximizing their shareholder value, there's a, a real contradiction between that and corporate social responsibility, other than making sure you have a good web page. And I could go on and give you some wonderful examples of this uh, contradiction, but but I, I think the the uh, the, the point uh, is clear. Um, there's one aspect I want to pick up that that has been featured in a whole series of articles in the New York Times, uh, which is the privatization of dispute resolution mechanisms. In my mind, one of the most important public functions is dispute resolution, the legal, the courts. And what's been going on in the United States and in many other countries has been the privatization of this process through arbitration. And it's been, I, 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 I just commend uh, all of you to read, it's been a whole series front page articles in the New York Times showing the disastrous consequences including and particularly to poor people uh, or even average Americans from this process. Where this is particularly salient right now is that uh, Canada and the United States are engaged in an, uh, a process of ratifying, or I hope not ratifying, the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And embedded in that TPP is a provision that says that if any corporation thinks that its rights have been uh, uh, violated, and I'll come to what, what uh, that means, it can sue directly the government. So it's an investor state disp dispute resolution, but it's a <coughs> suit that occurs in a private arbitration panel. That is very expensive. There's no appeal. There's no principle of precedence. So all the legal standards uh, are, that have been worked, you know, developed over a couple hundred years are undermined. And uh, the consequences, uh, and it's a very expensive. The judges can have conflicts of interest. You can be a judge in one case and a litigant in, the other, in another case on the same principle, on the same class of, you know, so you can have a, 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 a dispute over uh, Argentina privatizations, where in one case you are a judge, and in another case you can be a representing one of the parties. So, um, and the process is so expensive that in a recent case, for instance, uh, Uruguay, uh, is being sued by Philip Morris because it uh, regulated cigarettes uh, to say that you had to disclose that they were bad for your health <laughs> and not exactly a revolutionary idea. And they had a picture of what it was doing to your lungs, which is not very pr attractive, and it worked, and people stopped 
reduce their smoking, it reduced the profits, and the provision is that you can sue if there's a change in regulation that reduces your profits. You can be sued for uh, compensation for a loss of expectational profits, of a loss of expected profits. Not to get back your investment, but loss of your expected profits, whatever that means. And uh, the, uh, the cost of this suit is so great that Uruguay, Uruguay can't afford it. So Mayor Bloomberg is paying for Uruguay's defense because uh, he is committed to the idea of fighting. You know, in the United States, he, he passed strong regulations in New York City to discourage smoking. And he felt it was just outrageous that Uruguay couldn't do the same. So he's paying for it, but uh, that's what we, what, if you adopt TPP, that's what you will be adopting. Um, they can have a carve out in cigarettes. They say you can't do that anymore for cigarettes. But think about what this uh, means. So for instance, somebody discovers that asbestos is dangerous for your health. Right now, the legal framework in the United States, I guess I don't know your legal framework, is that the asbestos firms were sued to compensate people who were health were destroyed. And the whole sense of principle of Calabrese's and, you know, the uh, least cost avoider. Under this new principle, we would compensate the asbestos manufacturers for not killing us. It's a totally new legal framework. Uh, for those of you who know, uh, the, you know it's a question of, of regulatory takings. And courts have consistently in the United States said, you cannot, you know, there's no principle of regulatory takings, compensation for regulatory takings. So they failed in Congress. It was one of the things I fought very strongly when I, they tried to get it through Congress. And when I was chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors, we succeeded in making sure that it didn't happen. But now they're trying to do an end run through an undemocratic process through the trade agreement to get this into the law, into the trade agreement. So this is a big deal. I mean, you know, those of you, who, this is a really, really big deal. And that's why Elizabeth Warren has come out so strongly against it. Hillary Clinton, you know, Bernie Sanders. So the point is, it is a fundamental change in our legal frameworks that is not a minor change. And uh, I don't think your government has fully appreciated uh, uh, what is going on. And they talk about the importance of free trade. This is not about free trade. We can all agree it's nice to have free trade. But this is about changing the legal, con uh, legal framework of our societies. So moving from regulatory takings to tax takings, uh, Professor Duff. Thank you, uh, and thank you, Professor Stiglitz, for coming and, and doing this. Uh, I'm just coming off spending a ton of time writing a book on the details of partnership and corporate taxation. So it's a <laughs> thrill to read something like this, as Natasha said, to do sexy tax rather than like the embedded in the details of the rules. What, what I wanted to do is, uh, is actually reflect on the Canadian context a little bit and some of the tax policy uh, changes in the U.S. and in Canada that have uh, facilitated or led to growing inequality over time and what uh, uh, changes might be made to reverse some of that. Um, uh, less asking specific questions than uh, reflecting and then there are some po points where there'd be some slight disagreement I expect. Um, Canada, not surprisingly, has a sort of a similar track record to the US, although not as extreme. Our inequalities have not been as extreme and typically with a lag. It's really from the 90s into the mid-2000s that we have an extreme uh, 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 growth of uh, income and wealth inequality. And again, it's focused on the top 1%, the top 0.1%, the top 0.01%. Um, uh, so how has tax facilitated that here? Well, one story is the reduction in tax rates. Just as in the US, back in the Second World War, we raised tax rates up massively. Canada started its decline in about 1970. They were 84% at one point. And by uh, the early 2000s, had dropped federally and provincially to the range of 40 to 45 percent. Now, reducing those tax rates, how does that 
lead to inequality. Well, of course, people have more money. Affluent people have more money to reinvest, so there's more capital. Uh, but part of the story, which I, I, it resonates with me, I'm not entirely certain about it, is this rent-seeking story. You reduce the rates, there's a stronger incentive for people to just go out and try to get more money and bargain for more money. Uh, and that's what's happened more than uh, people working harder, the supply side story. And I, I, that resonates a, a lot with me. Uh, with the current government, I think we have clearly this opportunity to change some of this. And they certainly campaigned on reducing tax rates for the middle class, increasing tax rates on the most affluent. And our rates federally are going from 29 up to 33 percent. Well, they will. There'll be some screaming and yelling over the next little while about that, but they're committed to doing that. Uh, and provinces have also increased rates. So we're, we're going back, back now more to 48 to 54 percent, depending on the province. Some people will say, once you're above 50, oh, that's theft. Of course, that's reflecting a kind of libertarian perspective. Now, you and your book and others have said, well, we should go up to 70 percent, right, the rent-seeking story. Here's one place where I'm a little bit uncertain, and certainly quickly, that I think is a little bit of a concern. Um, uh, one, there are mobility issues. Uh, uh, two, there might be incentive effects. Also, frankly, there's, you don't want to kind of provoke a political backlash. So secondly, uh, in addition to that, of course, one way to get at some of these uh, 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 or more progressivity in a tax system is expanding the base. You talked about capital gains rates in the U.S. Canada has a similar story. Uh, we didn't tax capital gains until 1972. When we did, we introduced capital gains tax, but only half of the gain is taxable. In the late 80s, that went up to three quarters, but we reversed that story in the early 2000s, and that's, I think, part of the story. So we went back to a half. And if you look at the income statistics, 53% of the benefit from that partial inclusion of capital gains goes to the 0.8% of Canadian taxpayers earning more than 250000 So it's really concentrated. Uh, Similar story with uh, taxation of stock options, which has followed that one half to three quarter and then back down again. And there have been a surge of stock options uh, in the 2000s once we reduced the rates. And it's even more extremely unequally distributed. 80% of the tax benefit from not taxing half of stock options goes to the 0.8% of Canadians with income more than 250,000. So this is the low hanging fruit. Thankfully, the new government in addition to the rate increases uh, at the top margin rate, has said it's going to limit the opportunity on the stock options to 100,000. Let me talk about uh, two other tax things that I think are important. Um, so income taxes can affect wealth inequality going forward in terms of how much you retain or the incentives. Uh, but of course, uh, another main cause of uh, inequality uh, is, uh, is inheritances. Uh, I think there are some studies that say something like up to 50% of wealth inequality can come from inheritances. Uh, and it's interesting, you've, you've talked to a lot of people uh, focused on the United States on this, where the Bush administration repealed the estate tax, but it was phased in. They, it died for one year and it was brought back uh, uh, at a very, very high exemption rate. Canada, I don't think people generally know this, Canada actually repealed its gift in estate taxes in 1972. Uh, we haven't had these taxes for a long, long time. And, and the story in Canada is because when we introduced capital gains tax, we introduced a capital gains tax at death. It was politically too difficult to tax both of them. The feds got out, left it to the provinces. It all unraveled as provinces competed with each other. And it's kind of ironic that it was Trudeau the Elder who talked about a just society who eliminated one of the taxes that I think is most essential to a just society. Maybe Trudeau the Younger will uh, revisit that. One can only hope. Um, it's going to be a challenge with the uh, tax at death. The U.S. has this ridiculous arrangement where you just exempt all the capital gains taxes at death. Uh, um, and I could talk more about the design of them. I think actually an estate type tax is not as good as a recipient based tax. Final thing, because I got one minute left, uh, is uh, another a point of disagreement with you actually. Um, Okay. I want you to reflect on it. Just this one. <laughs> Fine. Thank you. Actually, you probably won't disagree with this. The, the final thing I want to mention is the GST. Now, GST is often criticized, sales taxes are often criticized by progressives as being regressive taxes. Uh, and it's true, they fall more heavily on people with low incomes. But really, one should think about the total fiscal impact. Who uh, relies most heavily on uh, uh, value added taxes like GSTs around the world? Scandinavian countries. Right? And they use the revenues to uh, ensure greater equality. They've got some of the most equal distribution of income in the world. 
who in this country dramatically reduced the GST rates. First major tax policy when the Harper government came in was reduce the GST rate by 2%. The annual cost of that is about $14 billion of lost revenue right now, which is $4 billion more than the deficits we're going to run for the next three years to fund infrastructure. We wouldn't need to run deficits if we had those GST points. So I, I think you've been kind of critical about regressive taxes like that, but I think there's a, a bigger picture to the story. And we'll probably have to revisit that in time, one hopes. Oh, okay. Okay, stop. <laughs> I'm stopping now. Okay. So uh, let me, let me um, maybe be begin by, by uh, maybe framing this a little bit in the American perspective, because, I again, uh, where the first order effect in American uh, taxation are uh, closing the loopholes that basically distort our economy and lower the tax rate. So the famously Warren Buffett said, you know, why is it, it it's wrong for him to pay a much lower tax rate than uh, his secretary? And he was paying about 15 percent, and his secretary was, you know, the, the, uh, was probably twice that, right? But that was 17 percent, 15 percent on his declared income. Uh, and I don't want to impugn that he actually wasn't declaring income that he was supposed to, but most of his income was unrealized capital gains, and if you included realized capital gains, his his tax rate was probably really, really uh, small. So. One of the proposed, so, so a lot of us were saying in the United States that what we ought to do, the first order is to um, eliminate these two provisions, the step up of basis on death and the preferential treatment of capital gains and dividends. And those two provisions alone, now uh, these magnitudes are hard to compare, so I, uh, are $2 trillion over a 10 year period. So that's a lot of money, even for a relatively rich country. You could do a lot for $2 trillion. Uh, and then, in addition to that, there are proposals actually coming out of some people in the Obama administration uh, to tax capital gains constructively. So rather than just on realization, uh, effectively constructively, so imputations and so that would – there's a that, that would increase the revenues probably in either another 25 percent. So so those are big reforms of that would actually reduce distortions in our in our tax structure. So to my mind, that's the first order of business. Now, on the issue of the whether what is the effect of raising the top marginal tax rate? There are a number of studies looking just at the balance between, you know, looking at the adverse incentive effects using reasonable numbers on labor supply elasticities, which say that the tax rate ought to be at least 70 percent. That's not talking about rents. That's just looking at labor supply elasticities. Now, those are for an economy like the United States, not for a small open economy. So there is, there is a difference, and, and the United States taxes people on their global income and wherever you live at the individual level. So the only way not to be subjected to the U.S. income tax is to give up your U.S. citizenship. And when you give up your U.S. citizenship, we give you a prize of an exit tax. So, so – I think we ought to raise that exit tax, and there's a lot of – there was one, one – it got a lot of attention when one of the Facebook billionaires gave up his U.S. tax uh, – U.S. Uh, citizenship to go live in Singapore. Um, <laughs> well, anyway, <laughs> uh, the, but, but uh, it shows you what money can do to, 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 to people. But anyway, we have less of a problem than – uh, uh, smaller countries and and France raised their tax rate. I don't know if you know what happened. And, and one, the wealthiest person in France decided to give up his French citizenship uh, uh, to to move to Belgium and eventually, we think, to move to Monaco, where he could escape taxation. So that's, but that's an answer. What that really says, there needs to be more global cooperation. 
in taxation. But on this very important issue of whether lower taxes at the top actually are bad because they encourage rank seeking or are they uh, good because they increase incentives? This is the debate. There's um, uh, some empirical work that's been done uh, by Saiz and Piketty and their co-authors which has looked at what happens when you ch increase the marginal tax rate at the top. And the question is, did, does it lead to faster or slower economic growth? And if you thought that the dominant effect was the incentive effect, you would say it's going to lead to slower economic growth. There's no evidence looking across a large body of data that it leads to slower economic growth. So to my mind, that is at least very supportive of the theoretical arguments that rent seeking is important and that these incentive effects are greatly exaggerated. You know, um, you know I actually think that, they're, 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 that all this discussion about incentives is part of an agenda to persuade people that high tax rates are a bad thing. Um, it, 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 and, and actually there's been some interesting literature about, uh, um, about this agenda of, of talking about incentives. I mean, think about it the following way. Um, if you're running a corporation and you hire somebody to be your CEO and you say, I'm going to pay you $10 million, and he comes back and says, well, that's great, but if you want me to be not on the golf course four days a week, I want you to pay me a little bit extra for being in the office and actually running the company. And the way I want you to pay me is if the company does well, I want you to pay me extra. Now, if somebody said that to you, what would your response be? Would you want him to be your CEO? <laughs> I think your answer would be no. Just like if a heart surgeon said to you, you know, being a heart surgeon is really difficult. I have to focus my mind. I, there's so many other things I could be thinking about. I want my pay to be based on, if you live, I want you to pay me a bonus. <laughs> you die, well, you, you, I still want you to pay me for my time, but you don't have to give me a bonus. If a heart surgeon said that to you, would you hire him to do, do your open surgery? I think not. I think the answer is no. You really don't want incentives on a lot of, in, in lots of areas. We've, we've exaggerated. In fact, the whole thing about corporate CEO stock options is really a, one of the biggest lies that have ever been perpetrated. Because you ask the question, is there any relationship between, well, there are two aspects of this. Um, if the value of the stock goes up, is it because of what the CEO does? The answer is most of that has nothing to do with the CEO. Stocks go up because the interest rates go down. Stock, if an airline stock, it goes up because the price of gasoline goes down. It's a major input into it. Did, did the CEO be, is responsible for the price of gasoline? Obviously not. Now, th this is really a reflection of different corporate cultures. I was talking to the head of one of the largest Japanese corporations, and I asked him about the level of his pay and, and about stock options. And he said, you know, stock options, first of all, he said, if we got pay anything like America, it would be irresponsible. It would be corporate, it was irresponsible because it would be undermining morale within our corporation. And he said, stock options, he said, you know, obviously what I do has very little to do with the stock price. <laughs> and it'd be dishonest for me to claim that. So there, there is a sign of culture of, of a certain kind of responsibility that we don't have in America. I don't think our CEOs are so stupid not to realize this. I think they're smart enough to realize it. I've actually had a lot of talks with CEOs. I said, do you understand this? And at the end, they say, well, our shareholders don't, but... Uh. <laughs>
but, uh, but we don't want you to talk to them too much about this. <laughs> anyway, um, so, so uh, the, the oh, okay, okay, so final point that you raised in this light, uh, the, the issue of uh, general sales tax or value added tax. Um, first of all, one of the things that Norway does have that most other countries is they also have a wealth tax, which is very important. Uh, just as a little bit of a, of a hint about, a, a, a little bit of also response about the over-exaggeration of incentives, you know, there was that one year in the United States in which we didn't have any uh, uh, death duties. Those, if incentives were important, we should have seen an increase in the death rate, <laughs> especially in December. Loss and benefits. Uh, well, well it, as far as I know, there is no evidence that, that there was uh, assisted suicide or any other thing in that last month uh, while there was enormous returns for, for early uh, termination. So, um, um, but the, the, uh, um, one of the advantages that the value added tax does, it, it does generate revenue. Also, it avoids, it, it, it actually, uh, is a more, uh, there's less of tax avoidance and evasion that, and to me that's the most important argument. So at a reasonably low rate, um, I actually, I've supported this, uh, and particularly if it can be accompanied by increasing the progressivity of the income tax by eliminating, for instance, tax returns for the bottom 40%, 50%, then, as part of a, of a whole overall package, you need to look at the tax structure overall to assess the progressivity. And, you know, the Scandinavian countries have an overall, have an overall progressive tax structure. And that, to me, is really what's important, including trying to, uh, under, to reduce the degree of tax evasion, that, uh, avoidance that occurs today. And our final panelist, Professor Ford, is going to take us to the terrain of financial regulation. We keep the best for last. <laughs> Hi, and thank you, Professor Stiglitz. Um, all right, so I, in the interest of time, I'm conscious of time, and so I'm just going to cut to the chase as quickly as I can. And I think it's a question that, uh, that you cannot avoid in this audience, and it really comes down to what do you do about law and the lawyers? So. Um, in, in the rule of law chapter, in the price of inequality, you talk about a number of problems that, which contribute to inequality, predatory lending, bankruptcy law, um, uh, robo-signing, and mortgage document fraud, and a number of other things. Now, some of those problems are American. We have some equivalents in Canada. Certainly in Canada, this might be interesting to the students in the audience, um, bankruptcy does not get you out of your student loans if you declare bankruptcy within seven years of graduating. So, be warned. Hold on. Okay? <laughs> If you wait until you're seven years out of school, then it'll, your bankruptcy will forgive your student loans. Um, but we have problems with corporate governance. We have problems with stock options. We have all kinds of problems with short-termism. We have additional problems around um, financial complexity, around, for example, our asset-backed commercial paper uh, uh, market. Uh, covered bonds are a new problem these days with CMHC and uh, mortgage insurance. Um, there are a number of, of issues that are going on, and, and really, and, 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 and I think some of the, the, the connection within it really is the role of um, legal structuring in, around these sort of subtle, almost back office phenomena. So, people, so these are not the kinds of things that people necessarily campaign over, but in fact these are structural choices to privilege um, the more powerful actors in society. And lawyers are, um, are involved in those both behind the regulatory moment, so in the actual technical structuring of a financial uh, instrument, for example, as well as after the regulatory moment around, for example, negotiations around the details of the, of, of the Volcker rule, for example, or uh, figuring out how uh, a non-prosecution agreement toward a company can be uh, negotiated. So around enforcement and around the sort of the detailed rules, you'll also see a lot of, um, of legal work. And in fact, to some extent, some of the most interesting and challenging legal work out there is in exactly those kinds of places, so, you know, as well as financial work, but, but lawyers are, are involved very much in, in, this, um, in these structuring activities. Now, to be clear, I'm a fan of the legal project, I'm a believer in the rule of law, 
And, and I think that the stories around private arbitration only uh, confirm that further. And so I, I, I don't want to be taken to be saying that I don't, that, that I'm not confident in the sort of the bona fides of, the, of, of lawyers. But I do think that there is a question about what to do about law and lawyers, given that there is this tension between your obligations to your client and your obligations to society. And I guess I should also just add, say one more thing, and that's that legal ingenuity before the regulatory moment and after the regulatory moment is a problem regardless of how you structure the regulatory moment, right? So we can do the private public thing, and that's uh, susceptible to all kinds of gamesmanship, but bright line rules are susceptible to gamesmanship too, as the Enron debacle showed us. And so, so what do you do about the sort of um, extraordinary ingenuity of the legal profession? <laughs> I, uh, that's a really, uh, really hard question. Um, I think that uh, one of the one of the things that you try to do is to uh, uh, work towards simplification, because I think the uh, you might say that the 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 uh, Ptolemaic epicycle upon epicycle gives more room for this asymmetry of uh, legal force. So, so when you have, you know, so this has been the the at least in, again in the United States the the main thrust of the um, Financial Protection Agency, the Consumer Protection Agency that was set up in Dodd Frank, was to try to restructure. The, at least the interface between consumers and the financial market with simpler contracts. So yes, there will still be opportunities for gaming, but when you, have a, when you take out a credit card and there's a 20-page fine print document, there's more opportunity. You know, you know, they keep putting in more and more things to protect the bank. None of them are there to protect the consumers. If you have a one-page statement, and if you have courts that say, here is what you mean by that, this is the intent of the law. Remember, the intent of the law is to protect ordinary individuals, not the banks. Uh, and the banks are the people who are supposed to be financially sophisticated, and it's the borrowers who are, on average, less sophisticated. You know, try to get those presumptions stronger in the law. Then I think you, you can try to redress some of the imbalances that get created. There will always be those imbalances. I mean, I think that's clear. But it's trying to create a, a more level playing field. And that, in, in a way, the... Uh, uh, agenda of private arbitration that we talked about before was trying to create a less play level playing field. And it was actually interesting, some of the, the uh, articles uh, in the New York Times actually talked about the role of Chief Justice Roberts when he was a private practice as creating this unlevel playing field. So now you can feel what confidence we have in our Supreme Court as it rules makes judicial decisions about the appropriateness of the, the span of, of these decisions. Uh, so uh, to me, I think, you know, there's, other than a sense of social responsibility on the part of the, of the lawyers, and we know that we can't trust uh, norms uh, alone, to, to imb but we can try to help move those norms in the right way. Uh, I think uh, the only way is to create a legal framework where presumptions are more in favor of ordinary individuals and uh, uh, and create also legal frameworks that, uh, for instance, um, create, I know it can be abused, more opportunities for class action suits because those are one of the ways that you can redress these imbalances uh, a power. <laughs> we can continue the conversation over a glass of wine. <laughs> um, 
So I, I guess it, so it's my privilege to be able to thank you on behalf of all of us. And I have a gift for you. So I'll walk around and give it to you. But please join me in thanking Professor Stiglitz.